Okay. Good morning. I hope you are all enjoying EuroPython. Now let's talk a little bit about the cybersecurity. As soon as. Yep. Um, before we start, I have three disclaimers. Uh, first of one, uh, this is all my opinion. The following presentation is my opinion, and I'm not getting paid by any of the companies or open source projects for mentioning them. And third, I had to cut out some parts for DevOps uh, from my speaking part, but they will be in, uh, still in the presentation in blue color. Uh, you can ask me after the presentation about them. So uh, I'll start with briefly describing myself, then I will talk a little bit about what is the cybersecurity and why we should focus on it currently. Uh, then we'll do, we'll do together a threat modeling of an application. And I will finish with some more tips for where to start about with the cybersecurity. And I have one request, please ask questions after the presentation. And uh, I will also appreciate feedback face to face or by email after the presentation is over. So my name is Piotr Dyba. You can also uh, call me Peter, it's fine. I came from Poznań, Poland, which is two and a half drive from Berlin, a little bigger city, and about 15 hour drive from here, Rimini. I work at F-Secure Poland, where I'm a team leader and a software engineer in a project called Rapid, Det the Rapid Detection Service. Uh, I'm also a leading mentor at PyLadies, uh, where we are currently having up to 220 students, which is our achievement. It's, we are, are running over three years now, and we will be starting fourth year this year. And probably I will talk a little bit about it more on the Flash Talks. Um, so let's start from the scratch. What is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is means and protocols to defend uh, your resources and devices from an attacker, damage or theft. So cybersecurity doesn't start at application level, it starts at hardware. So the policies and protocols for your employees, how to handle equipment, how to handle servers, what are the servers policy access, and what can an employee bring to the company. So it often happens that employees should be banned to bring their own pen drives. So there won't be, uh, for example, a source code leak. And then we can go to hardening our uh, uh, software architecture, software services, uh, which we'll focus on in this talk. Uh, okay, cybersecurity is becoming more and more important. As you are seeing, the number of leaks and attacks is growing exponentially. The biggest leak happened this year and it was over 1.3 billion user accounts data. It's more than most of the years beforehand. And uh, it's still increasing. Um, who remembers this screen from just two weeks ago? Yeah, uh, NotPetya laid waste on many companies across the globe just in one day. And some companies are still recovering from it. There are two very known, uh, publicly known well, uh, cases, like TNT, so the um, courier uh, company, and Rayban, the corporate courier company. Rayban is a really nice example of well-executed recovery, during which, in less than 24 hours, company changed their server architecture from Windows to Linux, in less than 24 hours. <laughs> Sounds great, right? But there were, we assume they were prepared for something like to happen. And this graph shows a number of attacks per day uh, from our public Honeypot network, which, we are, which I'm developing with my team. It's two to 16 million attacks per day. So who knows what a Honeypot is? Raise your hand, please. Okay, quite few. Uh, for the rest, I will explain. A Honeypot is a server that uh, is a trap. Um, interesting trap for attacker because it should be easy to access, where we can monitor and lock the actions of the uh, attacker, uh, but it won't affect our server architecture. It's a disposable server, a trap, where we emulate services like SSH, SMTP, HTTP, etc. And in our, in our team, we are doing everything in Python, purely. And uh, this is the data we are also gathering, so the username and passwords. 
I'm amazed how ma uh, it's mostly bot data probably, we assume. Nobody is trying to look, look in, in over SSH to using root root password. But because the intensity of the scanning with those credentials, we assume that some people don't change that. So they are still scanning using the uh, default data for some services like Raspberry Pi is quite high. I think it's fifth place. Yep. Um, so currently we established that cyber security is important. Paraphrasing this, uh, this nice comics, it's important that we start incorporating the cyber security at the beginning of the project, not after we get hacked. Okay. Uh, one of the basic things that we should start doing uh, when we approach cybersecurity, it's threat modeling. It's an approach for analyzing a security ap of application or a system. Uh, it should be structured and identify, quantify, and address the security risks uh, associated with the target of the modeling. Now, let's imagine we are a Batman. Everybody knows a Batman. Who, knows, who doesn't know who is a Batman? One person. I think he's trolling. Uh, anyway, uh, we have four main assets. We have our base of operations, so uh, uh, our Batcave. We have Alfred, our butler who handles everything for us. And we have information in form of emails and text. Now, we have threats. We have three main threats, which is police, uh, our arch enemy Joker, and the press. Uh, let's quantify the threats. So, Alfred is irreplaceable, he's a human being. Uh, he also has access to all of our systems and uh, assets. So he will be our highest priority uh, when defending and the highest risk at the same time. Then we have our bat cave, but we can rebuild it. It's just equipment. And lastly, we have information, so emails and text messages that, um, uh, that can show where are we going or what are we doing. But honestly, we can mitigate the press and the, and the police because we can handle them. Lastly, let's try mitigating those issues. So we can obscure Alfred's location and his identity, but in current world, it is really hard to do. Then the Batcave is a much simpler task because there are security systems, traps, misleading base of operations. We have a ton of possibilities to, uh, to handle the problems uh, concerning our Batcave. Bat and for the emails and messages, we can start encrypting them, which is the basic approach. And obviously, we should be cautious when typing something that may be delicate for us. Now, we will start working about, uh, on our uh, application that we'll try to make secure. Um, so, as in our Batman example, we'll start from identifying our assets, uh, purpose of their users. Uh, the next step will be identifying the, um, uh, our interactions with the, with the third party software and other parts of our service. Uh, and then, uh, this is one of the most important things, the ACL, so access control list. So who can do exactly what? And uh, just by specifying this and um, using those ACLs or during the whole application development, you can uh, uh, defend your, uh, yourself against many other things. Uh, one tip, if you are already started developing your application and you have a proper development methods, you may reuse your data flow diagrams or application UMLs uh, as a base of the uh, decomposition of the application phase. Behavior tests and integration tests are also useful for just that. There are a few frameworks like Stride or application uh, software frame, IASF, uh, that should give us a reliable output that should include logging and uh, auditing. And just to be on one page, auditing is who did what and possibly why, and logging is what's happening. And those are two different things that we should distinguish and probably have the data in different services afterwards. Then we have uh, authentication and authorization. And again, to be on the same page because it's also often misleading, authentication is um, asserting if the person who 
uh, claims to be, it's the person who it, who it is. And authorization is a process of determining who is allowed to do what. Configuration, um, sorry, uh, configuration management, so where do we store the configuration and who has access to it. Uh, then uh, data storing and data process, um, uh, data storage and data uh, transit. So if we are storing the data securely encrypted and if the data in the transit is also uh, encrypted. So if we use TLS, for example. And last, um, managing and handling exceptions and uh, what we should do uh, when an exception occurs, the protocols. Okay. Uh, now we need to measure the uh, the severity of the threats uh, we may encounter. We can approach that, that by ourselves, using, uh, uh, using our own mind and uh, figuring what is the most important, but we can also use uh, CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. This is based on a few factors like attack vector, attack complexity, um, privileges, user interaction, uh, scope, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. All together can give us a reference point, uh, but it's, for example, hard to measure how much, uh, how, uh, uh, how the attack will, more, will be complex. We usually don't know that, so it's wise to put both values and take an average or leave it as arranged for comparisons. And we need to remember that this tool is just a tool to help, not an oracle what we should do. And as mentioned before, use cases, UMLs, and abuse cases, especially abuse cases, UMLs, will greatly help us deducating what we should do, or whether we should start, and what are our priorities. Uh, next, we need to address the issue uh, at hand. So we have four ways, to, uh, four ways to do that. First one is completely remove. That's the nice way, but not always possible because of the uh, task at hand, we may not be able to, mitigate, uh, to remove it at all, but we may need to mitigate it. Uh, because, for example, it's too uh, expensive to uh, remove it uh, for many different issues. Uh, then, uh, the third option is we can take the risk uh, and address it later, for example, because uh, um, because if there is an issue, for example, an uh, outside person, an anonymous user, can traverse over a file directory with some random names of our users' cats, of pictures of our users' cats. So we don't really care if he gets the pictures. Probably our users don't care also. And you need to type some random gibberish just to get the picture. So there's much more work uh, on the attacker side than on ours to achieve anything. And fourth option is uh, pretend there is no issue. I don't recommend that. Uh, so, for example, if a person, uh, outside person, can download our configs or uh, password databases, and we don't do anything about it, we are just asking to be hacked. So, let's start making a thread model of our simple imaginary application in PHP. So, as everyone knows, PHP is very secure and hack-proof language. <laughs> uh, probably as secure as Internet Explorer was a few years back. It was not maybe the best browser for seeing the Internet, but it was definitely the best browser for Internet to see you. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we will not be using PHP, because PHP should stand only for Python has power. Uh, so let's build an application uh, using AngularJS for frontend, Sunning uh, for backend, and uh, PostgreSQL and Nginx for other things. And we will be having a home uh, endpoint for serving the HTML and uh, JavaScript. Uh, we will also have a longing endpoint dedicated just to that, and some list and one instance views for other uh, blocks and users. So. How can we hack our app? Considering now front-end, there, there are many possibilities that we should think of. Uh, every developer that uses JavaScript may find some weaknesses, but probably someone did that for us already. 
And of course, there's a huge project called uh, Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP in short. And it's good to remember this name because it will uh, be many times in this presentation. And it's co collaboratively developed by thousands of, uh, thousands of users. It consists not only examples of attack, measures their severity, but also includes a business level a communication, so also a non-technical person, like a project manager, can handle and uh, tell, uh, tell the uh, upwards that uh, we need to really do that uh, something about it. Uh, OWASP is much bigger knowledge than only the threats. It also consists information regarding tools, books, events, and other interesting sites and projects. And what? One thing is very important about OWASP, it publishes a list of most commonly used attack vectors uh, in the past years. Uh, the last one we are seeing here is from 2013. And the second, the newest one should come up this year uh, quite soon. They were arming from July. They have still some chances. And uh, I will go briefly by all of the uh, attack vectors uh, and explain some of them that are uh, less obvious. So injection, who did uh, hear something about SQL injection? Of okay, course, most of you, not all. So SQL injection is basically to inject your own SQL code into the uh, SQL that is run by our API. For example, drop tables users. And then we have broken authentication and session management. Um, the issue here is that uh, many applications don't store properly their users, so it is easy to hijack other user session. Cross-site scripting. This one is really fun because it allows, uh, allows an attacker to run a script on other users' browsers. So it will not affect us directly, but it may make our other users download some malware or send their credentials to our web page to a to a attacker server. Uh, insecure direct object reference. Uh, who doesn't understand this one? There are a few four hands. Not not um, so many people understand that. And um, we'll just move on. Security misconfiguration is really obvious. Uh, sensitive data exposure. So if we are exposing something more than we want to. Uh, making functional level access controllers, ACLs. I will talk about it a little bit more later. Uh, Cross-site request forgery. So, who knows Django? Okay, so I think everyone. Uh, uh, when you, you should remember that when you are using uh, Django template language and designing your uh, forms, you were inputting a, a CSRF token in the beginning of the form. Uh, someone did not include that in their template. Please raise, raise your hand. That's great. Wonderful. Because this uh, minimizes the chances of your form to being abused. Which is really good. Uh, if you are not doing that, you should start. Uh, doing that is just a line, one line of code in, in uh, Django template language on Rujinja uh, that will uh, save you from a lot of trouble. Um, Using components with known vulnerabilities, that's obvious, and unvalidated uh, uh, redirects and forwards. You should validate your forwards, that's just the use case. And if you want to play with any of these um, vulnerabilities uh, by yourself, there are two projects, the Bbox project and the OWASP broken, uh, broken web application project that allows you to run an image of an application that has all of these vulnerabilities and there's even a scoring test and there you can choose even a level how hard the vulnerabilities should be to notice. And the application is obviously written in PHP. So it's, that's why it's really easy to hack. Python is a little bit more uh, prominent in this matter and I will talk about it soon. Now, so for our AngularJS, um, there may be an injection coming there, but we should validate the injections on the back end. So uh, injections won't happen on our front end directly. Uh, broken authentication session management may happen. It's the JavaScript, so uh, it's not the back proof completely. Uh, Cross-site cross scripting, so XSS, 
definitely may happen, and it often happens on the uh, JavaScript part. It may, it cannot happen on the backend part uh, because it's not uh, exposed in that manner. And rest of them is more obvious. Uh, we'll move forward to uh, the summary. Uh, that is that AngularJS mitigates most of them by itself out of the box and even handles uh, some of them completely. So as long as our developers don't do anything really stupid, we are fine when using the basic uh, AngularJS. But it's important when we are extending without external libraries that uh, we'll review their code. And I will also mention that later. So Sonic. Sonic is a Python web uh, framework that using, is using AsyncIO and UVLoop. So what can go wrong there? And uh, of course, there can be some Python code injection, but not really, uh, unless you are using eval or exec or pickle. Uh, with pickle, it's uh, quite an uh, obvious case because even in the documentation, it's, it's uh, explicitly said not to use pickle with user input. The exec and eval also uh, are not the best idea. So for Python, uh, the problem usually exists between chair and the keyboard. So the developer. So it's on your hands to make your application secure on Python level. But many people wonder why we would like to use exec or eval. Uh, well, get, I will get back, sorry. Um, I forgot to mention, there is a uh, um, beautiful explanation on why, we shouldn't, uh, why the pickle is so uh, fragile uh, in terms of security. And there was even a bug in Twisted in 2011 that you could exploit easily. It's fixed, but this is a really great example uh, how pickle can be exploited. And you are, if, if you are more interested in this part, uh, there is a link below. I need to minimize my other window because it spoils my presentation. Okay, now moving to eval and exec. And you can see two codes. I'm not sure if my pointer is working, no. Uh, they, bo they do both do the same thing. The first one is just simple code. The second one is compiled and executed code. As you can see, it runs 30 or even 40 times faster uh, when executing a compiled code uh, than the normally run code. Even 40 times faster on Python 3.5. This is a huge uh, difference in the code execution times that can be used, but it can also be abused. So we have issue here, but also we have advantages. So uh, we can use obviously exec and eval uh, in our code, but we just need to do it carefully. And for the eval example, and as you can see, implementing that uh, takes a string and do some calculation, even a simple equation already needs more than 10 lines of code. It probably can be done simple, but just to show, eval will just take the equation and give you the result of the equation. So it's much easier and it also can handle much uh, more complicated uh, equations. Okay, pictures are too fast. Uh, so we have SQL injections. Uh, SQL injection uh, should not happen when you are developing up your application in Python unless you are implementing SQL by yourself. Uh, Django RM and SQL RME are quite secure. We've tested them uh, additionally and we didn't find any way of explanation uh, by our consultancy team. Uh, that would allow you to exploit anything in this ORMs. Uh, but there is a third option, uh, Python injection and SQL injection. And it's possible and it's doable. And uh, many people don't know that, that uh, and many people do use pickle as an object storage in uh, Postgres SQL or other SQL databases. And when you are using SQL databases and store a pickle, then you, a user can input your Python code there. For example, this one nice liner, which will de delete also all things on your machine when it's run. And just for doing that, we can like post an object like post and then refresh the page to read the post and it will be executed. 
and it's possible and you, it's hard to mitigate this problem. Uh, you can approach that issue in two ways. Uh, by not using pickle and using JSON for storing the information that will be needed for a class builder later on, if we, are to want to, if we would like to store a class, and uh, for storing um, dicts and uh, list just them, it's better to use JSON purely. We can also try mitigating that by writing our own anti-Python uh, pickle injection uh, validation, but usually it's hard because this code you can uh, make into base64 and then import base64 and eval the output of the base64 encoding the coding. So it's hard. Below is a simple uh, SQL injection that will drop user table. And most people use the user's table name even. So if not, they can also run other code execution that will tell them your database schema just by adding the apostrophe on the beginning. Um, so, as you can see, Python has more vulnerabilities than, uh, than um, a front end written in JavaScript, but most of them are already mitigated out of the box by Python, as I, I, as, and as I told you before, the, most, the main issue is with the developer. So, on, their, on your side, uh, it's important that you will care for the careful development and uh, proper means, and I will tell you now how you can do that. Uh, the first thing is when choosing a library, try to choose the more common one because it's already being used for more, for more users. And if you are not using a common library or Python project, uh, you should go through the code yourself and see if the data is not being sent on each post, for example, to KGB or NSA. And then, um, Uh, use, okay, sorry. Uh, using outdated libraries may also lead to uh, some issues. Uh, there's a well example of uh, Ubuntu 14.04, which has URLib uh, free, uh, already installed, but this version has the uh, bug in SSL uh, configuration and uh, that can be exploited. So just updating will uh, save you from being hacked. Those are the summaries for the DevOps. It's uh, quite funny because uh, Nginx and Apache, if it would be, or PostgreSQL has much more, much less attack vectors, but they are still being, being hacked quite often. So let's get back to our blog application. So uh, we have three users. Uh, everyone can access our uh, blog posts and read them. A uh, registered user can uh, additional write to the blog. Admins can manage the users and delete the posts. So uh, when we are decomposing the application, uh, in the first table we can see what the user can do from what the sentence I said before. And now we need to project that onto the relation, uh, uh, project that on the database interaction. So login, only read, quite obvious. Logout, it's important, it doesn't need to even access the database and so on. And for the rest of actions, so our API level actions, um, we have get post delete. Uh, someone may need to use put, but I will focus only on this three distance for now. For the uh, home directory, get is sufficient for uh, all users. For logging, only posts. And we can extend that only post from anonymous user. So a logged user can, shouldn't be able to log again, again, again to your application. And for logout, it should be also only available for logged users or admins. Uh, for the rest, it will depend how the, your structure of your project works, uh, looks like and uh, what are your company policies for um, architecturing an API. Okay, so we finish our uh, the composition phase of the application. Uh, we have everything we need. We can now go to uh, determining and ran ranking the threats. Um, so what is the most valued uh, part of our business? So it will depend 
uh, on our um, business uh, approach. It may be our information, so the blog post, the users, or confidentiality, so user emails and their passwords. Depending on our business model, it may vary. And how can they be targeted? Someone gets admin access, so he can do anything in our application. Uh, export the data, delete the whole application, etc. Uh, someone gets a uh, user level access. He can spam other users and possibly may access to their emails, which can be also another spam attack vector. Uh, next one are for DevOps. So those attacks, uh, server, server ownership, so on the infrastructure level. Next, um, our application source code can also be a target of an attack. Uh, when someone gets access to our version control system, he can uh, place some malicious code there. And if we don't have a proper review, it will pass quite easily. Even if we have a proper review, he can may still just click by himself because he's owner of the version control system. And uh, even if he gains only read access, it will be much easier for him to find a vulnerability in our source code than without knowing the source code itself. Okay, and As mentioned in the beginning, uh, depending on our business level, the business uh, approach, we may uh, have uh, different, um, different, uh, uh, different priorities and defending, for example, our uh, users' uh, credit card numbers, login password may be much more important than defending our uh, post database because usually we can recover when someone deletes the mine database. We usually have a backup, but uh, if we lose our uh, username, passwords, or more credit cards, we will not have any user anymore. We will all go away. So risk mitigation. Uh, one of the basic things we can do is adding multi-factor authentication for the user admins uh, level access. Uh, and also we can try uh, limiting the range of the AP, IPs that can access the admin panel at all. And uh, it's a good approach if your application is a microservice, so you can move all the admin panel to another microservice. It's also a good policy. And... Um, for the spam, uh, we can limit post per days, which may be not convenient for our users, edits per hour, shorter sessions, and adding CAPTCHA usually is also a nice idea. I will skip the DevOps part because we are running of all time, of all time, out of time already. And uh, part of the mitigation should be done already on unit test level. So when you are making unit test, don't focus only on happy paths. Do the wrong pass also, so all exception handling and rising exception should also be done. Uh, on the unit test level, it will mitigate some of the security issues. And there's one, like, one nice project I will mention, for more, maybe more for DevOps, SSH, H, SSHTTP that hides our SSH access in a plain sight. So on the same port we have HTTP and SSH access. Uh, okay, now tooling for automation. Uh, for Python, we have a dedicated uh, library called Bandit. Uh, it analyzed our code using abstract syntax uh, tree. Uh, can be easily integrated with Jenkins. And it will find the most common vulnerabilities uh, in our application. Like exec and eval should be highlighted. It works similar to PEP8 tool or PyLint. You will get nice report after running the application. Then we have SonarCube. This is a much bigger project that handles over 20 languages like JavaScript, HTML, and more. Uh, it has a dedicated Jenkins plugin with security gates that will allow you to uh, not pass the code if you have found a vulnerability in our code test. Uh, I really recommend looking at SonarCube uh, because it's all in one tool. It's free, you can um, host it yourself or you can buy it as a service. 
Next, we have uh, automatic scanning tools. We have Zap and Burp. Zap is uh, created by OWASP project. Uh, it's free. It has uh, it has uh, Jenkins ready plugins, and it's dedicated to all web application. Just first run of the most uh, common issues will probably make allow you to find some uh, security bugs. Uh, Burp is a more commercial alternative, uh, and it doesn't have a Jenkins plugin, plugin already. It's, uh, it should be coming up soon. Uh, both of them are web scanners, so they will map your site and try execute common attack methods and patterns. Uh, then we have um, uh, Metasploit, which is more based on uh, more uh, infrastructure-based and system-based uh, attack um, framework, and SQL Map. It's for all SQL interactions uh, in our project that could be uh, attacked. Uh, and lastly, we have Scapy. This is a Python uh, library that allows us to prepare any kind of um, TCP or ICMP packages and also UDP datagrams with any payload. Lastly, there is commercial uh, solutions and uh, managed service like Qualysis, um, Nasus, which is one of the most popular, I think, and F-Securator. Uh, the advantage of managed service is that you will receive a report that, does not that should not contain any false positives from the, uh, from the scanners, because scanners usually bring you some uh, false positives still. And okay, I will need to go fastly. Uh, who is a, uh, why do we need a pen testing and what is a pen tester? Uh, pen test, in short, it's an uh, authorized attack on application or up, or in our infrastructure. Uh, we should do pen testing for um, removing all the security weaknesses and also for compliance, like, or compliance like PCI compliance. Um, what's the target of a pen test? So usually when pen tester is attacking our application, he has two goals, obtaining restricted information or elevating his access to an admin level. Uh, best case scenario, it should be done by a third party and uh, we should use also the automated tools I mentioned before. Uh, we should do also it uh, when uh, we end a development cycle or when we have a new big feature that may be vulnerable to attack that other parts of application are not. But who is a pen tester? Pen tester, quite obviously, is a person who performs a pen test. It's not a method of pen testing, it's just the person. Uh, you can also call them uh, security consultants, hackers, white hats. Just remember not to call them crackers or black hats, which means basically criminal, because they will become sad and you don't want to have a sad hacker on your team. Really, you don't want to have that. And uh, also there is something called red teaming drill that's more, ex more extensive than uh, normal uh, pen testing because it starts on the security level. Usually red teaming drill have budget for uh, physical damages like uh, destroyed locks, uh, broken windows. Uh, also it covers planting bugs. Uh, one important thing is uh, that is uh, when a red team drill uh, goes undetected, that means you have really big issues because an attacker, when he achieves his goals, for example, bounce a bug and record your conversation with your boss, uh, starts being noisy to a level when someone who should have noticed it. Okay. Uh, there are three major approaches when pen testing. Uh, the white box, so uh, our consultant has access to everything, including uh, our uh, production servers, configurations, uh, documentation, source code, etc. Then we have uh, gray box testing. We limit his access uh, to the, our infrastructure. Uh, he has access, basic access to application and possibly a moderator access if it's obtainable by a user. And uh, he has still access to our documentation and our source code. The attack becomes then targeted because he can find weaknesses in our source code and try to exploit them. And then there is black box. So attacker does not know anything about our application except what is uh, available on the internet, public internet. 
Uh, he doesn't have access to the source code, but he may obtain it during the attack. Also, same goes for the documentation. Then, uh, last thing, which is becoming more and more popular, uh, CISO, uh, which is security information uh, of uh, cyber security, sorry, chief uh, uh, information security officer. Uh, that's responsible for many things, uh, like uh, incident response teams, uh, information risk management, uh, information regulatory compliance, so for example, PCI, Data Protection Act, or GODO in Poland. And also for IT security and security awareness in the company. And the last one is currently very important because of the phishing attacks that may happen even of, uh, on our non-technical staff. And if we are getting hacked, there are four circles of being pwned. One, being hacked by a bot or a uh, script kiddie, and being attacked by very known vulnerability. Both of them uh, are very shameful for your company. You will be uh, mentioned on the internet in very not nice ways, and uh, for the security people, they probably should rethink their career choices. It's that bad, really. And then being hacked by a quite new vulnerability, it may happen we didn't patch our system, so we need to improve our protocols. And lastly, we are attacked by unknown vulnerability, or, or so-called zero day, uh, which is also a proof that our security, till this point, were that good, the attacker needed to use uh, something new. Two important things. Uh, not seeing a destructive result of an attack doesn't mean we are, we're not hacked or not being owned for a longer period of time, because the target of attack may be just to acquire some information, and the last year Gartner report said that it takes 200 days on average for a company to notice an attack. Imagine what can happen in 200 days with your infrastructure being owned by an, a malicious user. Um, so, the internet is changing and a uh, few years ago it was commonly advised, for example, to move SSH to a higher port. Now we have mass scan, so we don't have to there's no point of moving it, and actually it may mess your firewalls if you move uh, a uh, protocol to a different number than it should be. As mentioned, now we are ordering strangers to bring us home. Uh, this is a curated list of uh, interesting links uh, that may help you uh, go into cybersecurity. Some of them were mentioned. If something was not mentioned, it's uh, on Awesome Security GitHub or on the OWASP project site. Last thing, just from today, yesterday, there's a great talk about uh, passwords and why we should not use them uh, on EuroPython. I hope I will see it again on YouTube soon. Uh, it was done by Justin Mayer uh, yesterday in the morning. Um, I hope you enjoyed my talk and learned something. I don't know how to summon the Dark Lord yet. <laughs> uh, but I will gladly answer your questions. We have time for one question. So if you, um, if you ask a, um, a pen tester to pen test your system, you said there are three ways. Yep. Uh, which one, because I mean the white box, you just give everything and the black box, you don't give anything. What would you suggest uh, if you have a system and you want to pen, te pen test, like which of these approaches would you take? Honestly, it uh, vastly depends on your budget and uh, your ability to sustain your servers during a pen test when black boxing, because black box testing is quite demanding because it's done on the production system. So unless you can scale up to handle the black box testing, maybe gray box will be more, more advised. And if not, white box testing also, all of the tests should bring you different results. So when you are having, for example, periodically uh, pen testing, it's wise to change the methods. So we will get a different outcome. Thank you all for coming. And thank you for a great talk.